What a time that we have had together studying Psalm 27, looking at the life of David and the character of God. I know some of you, we heard from in the beginning at the onset of the study, when we told you what the study would be this semester, some of you were like, really? We're gonna do a whole semester on one psalm? <laughs> and yet, I've also heard just from some of you of just how you have grown closer to the Lord and how God has changed you as you have studied this psalm and you have experienced him through the attributes that David of God that David identified in Psalm 27. So we're gonna finish in just a second after I pray by going through the whole psalm and then focusing on the last two verses. Um, but before we do, let's go ahead and bow our hearts and our heads before the Lord. Father God, we stand in your presence, Lord, as women surrendered unto you. Sometimes, Lord, that word surrender is one that I know for myself doesn't come easy because it is truly a putting down of our desires, our wants, our wishes, and truly picking up all that you have, including the cross. And that we walk through hard, but you are with us. You are faithful and true. You are a good God. And we truly can surrender as you want us to. Surrender, Lord, all that we are to all that you are. So, Lord, as we are finishing up our study on Psalm 27, God, I pray that you would just meet every woman in this room listening online, the ladies tonight, Lord that you will finish the work that you have started in them through this study, that we would be women who are transformed, Father, the renewing of our mind set on Jesus Christ and who you are. God, I ask now as I always do, that as I get ready, Lord, to share your word, that you would hide me behind the cross of Jesus Christ, that you would be magnified, that I would become small and you would become great. And that these women, Father, would all hear from your heart directly to theirs exactly what you know they need to hear. God, I pray that you would guard me from saying anything that I, you would not have me to say and that I would be so sensitive to your spirit, Lord, as I am teaching. Be with us now, Lord, we pray. Move among us and do what only you can do and be our teacher, be our guide. Make us, Lord, into your image. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we are on the hope. Notes are on page 151 for the note takers. And um, we are going to end by reading through the uh, Psalm 27 in its entirety. Starting with verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle. He shall hide me, he shall set me high upon a rock, and now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me or forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me and such as breathe out violence. And our last two verses, 
I would, that I would, uh, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And verse 14, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. So as I was sitting with these last two verses, obviously the word wait is in there. And so it really got my mind thinking about all of the ways that David had shared his heart with us through this whole psalm. And that here at the end, he finds himself in a waiting room of sorts. Waiting for God to move in his circumstances, deliver him from hardship. He certainly has talked of his enemies. And so he's in this this waiting season, this waiting room, we're going to call it. And I would imagine that every single one of us here, if I asked you to raise your hands, is probably waiting on something. Yes? Let's raise our hands. Pretty much everyone is waiting on something, myself included. Through much of life, we sit in all sorts of waiting rooms, right? There was a Timex study as I kind of dug in, like, okay, really, how much do we wait? This Timex study said that Americans on average wait 20 minutes a day for a bus or train. They wait 32 minutes when they visit the doctor, 28 minutes if they go to an airport and have to sit in security, 13 hours annually on hold waiting for customer service, amen to that, how you try to bypass that, right? Person, person, (laughs) at least I do. And 38 hours each year waiting in traffic. That's a lot of waiting. There was another study that said on average, there's probably about six months of your life you're spent waiting in some capacity. And whereas we can feel, right, as we come and go and, and like do life in the physicality that there is a waiting, I think the challenge for us is when it's personal. When we are waiting on those personal things that personally affect us every day. Where we find ourselves in the already, but not yet. Kind of the in-between. I don't know what you're waiting on today as you sit here, as you listen. Maybe you're waiting on test results. Maybe you're waiting for a new job for you or your spouse or a child. A prodigal to return home. Maybe you're waiting for a house to buy, a marriage to be restored. Maybe you're waiting for a heart to mend, a sickness to be healed, or a breakthrough to come in some way or some way just through a very difficult situation. I know for me, as I wrote the last acting section of the homework, I feel like I've been in a waiting season for about a year and a half. Certainly not life or death. I've been in those as well. But this one certainly touches on some pretty big life details. And here's the thing about waiting rooms. We can often feel like they're a waste of time. Anyone? Needless reading material that sits around that room, magazines that might be two years old, really with material that you could care less about because Hollywood, who cares? Mindless TV watching with a channel you really didn't pick, but you kind of find yourself watching it. Maybe social media scrolling. And everyone is waiting in that room for their name to be called, for answers to come, for some direction, for some movement forward through whatever it is they're waiting on. Waiting is so hard, isn't it? But as much as physical waiting rooms can feel so pointless, where we're just like, come on, let's just get on with it. I got better things to do. God's waiting rooms never are. They are never pointless. It is in that space of time, girls, in our lives 
when God is working, he is testing our faith and our commitment to him. He is often building trust and perseverance, preparing us for what he knows is coming next. You never know if God will call your name next and that right now in your season of waiting, you are on the verge of a miracle, just like Lazarus from John 11. When the Lord said, Lazarus, come forth. I love in Psalm 27 that David shows us the humanness of waiting. He began by saying the words in verse 13, I would have lost heart. The King James Version says, I had fainted. And the NSAB says, I would have despaired. You see, in this thing that David is experiencing, he recognizes how close he could have come to giving up. Maybe becoming numb and saying, there, there's just no hope with this situation that I'm waiting on. How many times have you been in a physical waiting room surrounded by irritated people? Grumbling. Grumbling at the wait. Maybe you've been that person. Waiting rooms certainly can test our patience. Waiting rooms can certainly cause us to lose heart. And we can get all agitated in that space. And sometimes in those physical waiting rooms, have you ever, as you've sat there, kind of looked at your watch like seriously, seriously, and then you go up to the receptionist like, how much longer do you think it's going to be? Like, I got something to do next. And then you go take your seat and everyone's kind of a little agitated, just waiting, waiting. But here is the key to why David didn't lose heart. It's like the secret of the weight, the secret ingredient, and it's really, really simple. David said in verse 13, I would have lost heart, what word is right there? Unless, unless. I believed. Unless. Don't forget that unless. It is our faith, girls, the belief that God is after. It is the secret ingredient. God wants us believing and trusting wholeheartedly in him. Hebrews 11 says, 11.1. I'm sure this is a familiar verse to many of you. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I'm going to say it to you another way. Oh, oh, not there yet. Oh, 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 oh. How do I go back? Okay. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Said another way. Faith is an unshakable belief that God will do everything everything he has promised to do even before there is visible evidence to that effect. Visible evidence. We believe unshakenably. Is that a word? We believe steadfastly in God that he is going to do everything he has promised. Again, he has promised to do even before we see the visible evidence. Do you believe that? Faith is so needed for each one of us. But you have to also consider that faith must be placed in someone or something. And it is our response, going back to the irritation of that waiting room, the restlessness that our response in the waiting room often reveals much about our faith and where we ultimately place our hope. Do you find yourself one of those agitated people right now in your waiting room? Or do you find yourself at peace? Maybe somewhere in the middle. 
And if you're agitated, as I sometimes find myself, I have found these three questions that are so useful to ask yourself. If you are one of those people sitting in a waiting room right now, and man, you're just like, you know what, I I've had it. You can feel you are right on the edge of losing heart. Maybe you feel a little numb to the Lord right now. You're not pursuing him the way you used to. You think, why pray? He's just going to do what he wants to do anyway. Here are three questions I have had to use with myself in my own season, and I share with you this morning. In this thing, this waiting season, where I feel agitated, am I fearful? Am I fearful of what lays on the other side? That fear often shows us we have a faith issue. Am I frustrated? Am I so frustrated because things are not working out the way that I had intended them to? I, had found, I find myself here sometimes. Just, okay, Lord, I don't really know what you're doing, but I want to know what you're doing. I am frustrated in the wait, right? Kind of like in that waiting room, just come on, let's hurry up and get on with it. I'll take whatever you want to give me, Lord, but let's get on with it. But no, he says, wait. Am I frustrated usually identifies a place of control where you are trying to control God, control an outcome, control. And then the last one, this thing you're waiting on, is this failure? Does this somehow make me feel as though I have failed? And typically, when we are in that place, we say yes to that question, we often have an identity issue. Who we are in God versus who we are or who we think we are apart from him. And girls, whatever, if any of those resonate with you, I have had to take those things because God is so gentle in how he meets us and just take it to prayer. He knows the things we're struggling with you're not like by not praying, like thinking he doesn't like know that thing, but he wants us to come to him and search him out to pray, Lord, change my heart in this area. Help me to surrender. And so what did David trust in? Because faith must be placed in someone or something. And here is such the beauty that we see that David didn't just trust in God because we can say, I trust you, God. I trust you, God. I mean, you've trusted him, Lord willing, for your salvation. You know he is the answer to your sin, and you have asked him to be your savior. And sure, yes, we have trusted him for all eternity. But here's what David says, right? He trusts God's character. He trusts his goodness. You see, the goodness of God encompasses his whole being. God is good. Genesis 1 tells us that every single thing he created was good. You, me, the heavens, the earth, the animals, it's all good. And I think we get tripped up because sometimes we apply a human understanding to that word good. What we think good should look like in our humanness. What we think our good circumstances should look like. And that's the reframing and the redirecting that I know I have often had to do is to go, no, it's not what I think is good. I must trust you, God, that you are are good inherently. We can't have more goodness of God. We can't have less goodness of God. He is just good. Every single thing about him is good. 
If we go all the way back to the garden after he said everything is good and there he has Adam and Eve and he plants them in the garden and we're told in scripture that they're walking with him in the cool of the day. They're fellowshipping with him. They have such an intimate relationship with him. And what is the tree that they can eat from? The tree of life. Because man, they had that abundant life. They were walking in the goodness of God. But what was it he said, don't eat from? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Have you ever thought about that? The tree of the knowledge of good and the tree of the knowledge of evil. You see, once they took that sin-ridden bite and they stepped outside of the will of God and they took from that place that they were not supposed to take, God said that they would spiritually die, but guess what else came? The knowledge of evil. God never intended us for, ha- for us to have the knowledge of evil. And yet how Satan in his deceitful ways, man, because he is that slithering snake, and there is he tempted Adam and Eve, oh, you can be like God, because God knows being all good. He knows all good, and he knows the effect that evil can have on his people. So much so that he was going to have to send his son, Jesus Christ, to redeem us back to himself because he is good. But now, Adam and Eve, as you and I, we have the knowledge of evil. And how Satan uses that against us, that in our waiting seasons, in our circumstances, man, he gets in there and he wants where your your head to go. On the goodness of God, That's not always my first tendency. It is on evil. This isn't good. And all of the other things that are in my imagination, works of the flesh, thoughts of the flesh, and no, girls, we have to go back to the goodness of God, trusting in who God is. He doesn't want us despairing, but boy, the enemy sure does. He doesn't want us to lose heart, but boy, the enemy sure does. Because the enemy is always going to be after our faith. We think he's after our stuff and our marriages, our children. Girls, he is after your faith. And who are you going to trust in? The goodness of God or not? You see, God wants us to see him remembering in all situations in every waiting room exactly who he is. God wants us seeing his goodness working and he wants us trusting his goodness when we don't. But in all things, in all times, in all circumstances, in every waiting room, to trust him. And it is when we trust his goodness and we put our wholehearted faith in him. We don't lose heart, girls. We can actually take heart. To take heart means that you are looking to the future with hope. That you are persevering in that waiting room. That your heart is not despairing. Oh, it may feel heavy at times. Sometimes we certainly can feel the hurt of our circumstances, but our hearts get strengthened, as David said, in the Lord, in verse 14. You looked at 2 Corinthians 4 in your homework, but I'm gonna take us ahead um, a couple verses, and I'm gonna read 2 Corinthians 4, starting in verse 7 through 16. Paul says this, but we have this treasure, the gospel message, Jesus Christ, in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but we are not in despair. 
persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that what? The life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh, so then death is working in us, but life in you. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that grace, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Therefore, therefore, verse 16, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day by day. Take heart, girls. Trust his goodness. You know, we don't really know when David wrote Psalm 27, but we know he experienced many waiting seasons. Just after becoming the king of Israel, God spoke promises over David's life that we looked at in 2 Samuel 7. And there was much anguish and heartache in David's life, consequences for his sin. And in all those promises that God spoke over him in 2 Samuel 7, David had to wait. It is estimated for some of them he had to wait 33 years. In 1 Kings 2, 1 to 4, that you looked at in your homework, David is on his deathbed waiting to enter eternity. He wouldn't see the temple of God built, but he sees his son, Solomon. And there he blessed his son as you looked at that in your homework because it would be Solomon who would carry on the legacy that God started in David. It would be through his son Solomon that God would fulfill his promises, that the kingdom of God would be brought to the people through Jesus eventually, and that there in wanting to have the temple built for God to dwell among his people. We saw that when he brought the ark in and the desire to have the temple built built that one day God would dwell with us all through his spirit. You see, David believed God's goodness, even though he didn't see it all in that moment. And he charges Solomon with the future. But here's the point I want us to get in this, that when David was doing all of that, he says something so beautiful in verse four. He says that the Lord may fulfill his word spoke concerning me. Don't miss what he's saying. David's faith wasn't in Solomon. David's faith was in God. In God. In how we can misplace our faith and put it in maybe the people we're waiting on or the circumstances we're waiting to move. Girls, our faith must be in God. You see, David waited all those years, but he waited on the Lord, not people. Psalm 27, 14, as we end, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. We aren't really waiting for someone or something to act. And if you are, could I gently challenge you, ask you to wait on the Lord? You see, we're told to wait for the Lord. We are to wait on the Lord. And scripture tells us to wait in the Lord. And even as I was writing that, do you see there at the top? I was typing up this slide. The Lord is our provision in all things. Do you see? He is pro-forward vision. He is our provision, and he gives us through hope in him that forward-looking vision when we are waiting on him. He's in each one of those waiting rooms with you. He hasn't forgotten you. 
Just because he hasn't called your name yet doesn't mean he's forgotten. He is so right there with you in every single one of the details that you are waiting on. But may your weight be in him and on him. Different versions of this word weight in verse 14 use the word hope in or rely on. And as we looked at this final chapter, these final verses in our, in our last week of study, it was titled Our Hope. And hope is not a feeling. It's not like this wishful, like, rubbing two pennies together, rubbing, I always get my analogies wrong, Brenda helps me. Is it two pennies? Is it one penny? Two pennies, okay. Or, or like, you know, the rabbit's foot. <laughs> she always helps me out. <laughs> she has a little book she keeps on the sta- <laughs> on the Stacyisms, on the stupid things I say. <laughs> but they're funny to her. Anyway, I digress. Okay, wait. It's not this wishful thinking. Hope, girls, hope is a person. And that person is Jesus Christ. And so you can put all your eggs in that basket. You can put all your eggs in the Jesus basket. Because you know that that Jesus basket is holy and fully good. Holy. Every single thing you need. And David gained courage and he gained confidence in each one of his waiting seasons as he believed God's goodness. Waiting patiently for God's timing and God's ways. Waiting on God to redeem the broken pieces, to fulfill his promise, to fight the enemy, to direct his steps. And God wants us waiting just like this too. The word wait in the Hebrew is kweve. You saw this in one of the questions in your homework. And when I, Brenda and I found this as we were studying, man, this one hit me really hard. So I'm gonna close with it this morning. Quave means to bind together. Bind together or twist together. Like, kind of like this rope, right? And we used, we told you that rope analogy. And throughout the whole study, we've been doing that whole tug of war in the application, right? Have you, hopefully you, you've entered into that piece of the application. But that word weight is like this rope. It is like, if you picture this rope is us. So the rope is, here's us, and we have received Jesus Christ by faith, and he has come, and he is living inside of you. He is alive. Well, the life of Christ is like every single one of these fibers. So we are sealed by the Spirit of God, and our life should be so intertwined with the Lord's and his so intertwined with us. Colossians 2.10 says, you have been made complete in Christ. Complete, having every single thing you need, provision. And Ephesians 3.19 says that we would be filled with his fullness. Like you see the, the thickness of this rope. So here is our life, and here in all these fibers, in all these yarns, the strands, it's like victor, salvation, strength, protector, defender, Oh, faithful, light, savior, strength, ever-present, hope. And there's so, so many more. It's like I think John said it. I could, it's like all the works of God can't even be contained in this book. It's like the, the, the beauty and the fullness and the richness of the life of Christ in us. That when the tension of life, if I had a big weight that I could put on the end of this, the tension of life is applied, and man, you feel that tension, you don't lose heart. Because it's strong and the strand holds. And even in those seasons where we're kind of pulling, don't really like it, Lord. I'm not really delighting in your fullness. I really want it my way. The strand doesn't break. 
the strand doesn't break and God will let us do those tug of wars, won't he? But really, again, he's after our faith and he wants us just to surrender. Just let go and trust the fullness of the life of Christ in you. Trust his goodness towards you. That we girls would be women who delight in him fully. That we would trust in him fully. That we would wait on him. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up like wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Take heart in him, girls. May he be your one delight. Let's pray. Father, thank you for just a word spoken this morning. Thank you for that in two verses Oh, Lord, do we have the fullness of you. You are good. God, I pray that we are women here this morning that would declare that. That we would declare that in the name of Jesus over every single one of our waiting rooms and our situations. You are good. And I will trust you. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.